Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Palliative Care Friday Chalk Talks. Today's episode is the first of a multi-part series over the coming year-ish, focusing on healing. And today is focused on how the medical teams heal themselves. Our returning guests today are the outstanding and fabulous dynamic duo of Chaplain and Rabbi Yannison Meadows and Palliative Care Social Worker Jen Greenwood, both from St. Luke's. Uh, with Advocate Aurora here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So Yoni, Jen, welcome. And I will hand the mic over to you too. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying that um, Yoni and I uh, definitely don't get to talk as often as we would like due to being so busy um, within our schedules. So we were talking one day and just felt this world needed more healing and uh, ourselves as healthcare workers working in what we do, we all need some healing. So that's what led us to having uh, this of part three, which are the last two are to be determined. And if you have any other thoughts, ideas, please uh, share them with us. It takes a village. It definitely does. So introductions, and today is um, entitled Basic Healing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why the why we've entitled this talk that. And... All of what we're talking about today is based very much in what is called psychodynamic psychology, which is something that Jen and I share as a background and as a passion. Mm -hmm. um, it's absolutely indispensable to the work that we both do, both clinically and um, educationally. And so basic healing is my homage to and connection to a... Um, psychological theory um, that was come up with that was uh, devised a, some time ago called basic fault theory. And this is something I've presented about before and talked about before. And very quickly, it came out of a realization that conventional psychoanalysis, conventional psychology was not working for many of the patients that clinicians are trying to treat. And they realized that the heart of the issue was that people's problems, people who are struggling with deep-seated emotional issues, wounds, you know, coming from their childhood and their and their lives, um, cognitive interpretation of their thoughts, their dreams, their um, what they had to share was simply not going to the root cause of what they needed, and they needed someone to help guide them into a journey of deep emotional healing. And before we go farther, I just want to, to share the definition of psychodynamic psychology, especially since um, many psychologists, um, it's even possible to come, th come through uh, grad school as a psychologist and be exposed to very little of it. It's not really the vogue these days. Um, psychodynamic psychology is very simply any of the schools of thought and psychology that understand the unconscious um, psyche, the unconscious mind, heart, and soul, as opposed to the conscious uh, mind, heart, and soul that we're aware of, but that the unconscious aspects of ourselves are important and to be contended with and make up an important part of who we are. So this goes to the heart that we are much more than simply what we realize we're thinking about in the moment, but human beings are a complex uh, soup pot, I like to think of it, um, of what we realize we're thinking about, what we want to show to the world, deep-seated, often buried experiences, um, aspects of ourselves that we are not comfortable with, that we often knowingly or unknowingly hide away, 
and all of our emotions and life experiences. And all of this philosophy undergirds um, what I call the full, the four rules of clinical work. And Jen's going to talk a little bit about this. I first learned this from my illustrious first chaplain mentor, the legendary chaplain Peg, Peg McGonigal here at uh, Aurora St. Luke's. Yes, it, this was, um, you know, learning these four aspects of clinical social work has really been embedded in our work pretty much since um, our master's program. And these are things that every single day I try to apply, um, not only with my patients, but um, also with uh, my family um, and showing up, which um, really means to be present to be fully engaged with that person, of putting our phones down, silencing them, listening to them, having that good eye contact, the acknowledgement that you're that you're hearing them, um, and so forth. So, and there is, I found um, Miss uh, Angels Arian. She is the one. There's a TED talk that I found um and there's a link later on that i've listened to it three times already and every single time i get out of it she's very inspirational very uh, direct um and, and, and inspiring but being present um just is showing that person that we genuinely care. And I think sometimes we forget that in our normal day that we're busy doing so many different things. Slowing down and making sure that we are hearing what our patients are saying to each other, hearing what our colleagues are saying to us their concerns, their worries, their fears that sometimes get brushed underneath the rug as we go out on our daily basis of doing the work that we we all enjoy to do. Uh, well, I'm speaking for myself, but um, I really enjoy our work. I love ideas off of not only these gentlemen right here, but um, our entire team. They're a wise group of individuals and with a great sense of humor. Um, in that TED Talk, we are the youngest country uh, in this whole um, world that we, sadly, the U.S., holds the highest suicide rate between our youth, which is one to 35, and then our, our elders, which is starts 60s on up. And she breaks it down for us. And our country doesn't, among other cultures, doesn't look to their elders for advice and for wisdom. Um, as other cultures do. She, in fact, uh, quoted Walt Whitman, convinced by the power of our presence. And I found that to be very true in many interactions with our patients and our families. If we are not genuinely listening and showing that we care, they can see right through that. And that loses a sense of trust, I feel often. Uh, and it's hard to gain that trust back very easily. Um, the second one is to pay attention. Pay attention to um, their body language, their eye contact, their voice, uh, and just uh, there's different 
um, ways that we can we can show our attention, um, but acknowledging their fears and just sometimes letting that awkward silence just continue, which it often isn't easy for many of us. It takes time and it takes practice. And still after practicing for many years, sometimes it can be difficult. Uh, the third one is tell the, the truth and love uh, with compassion and, and so forth. And so we want to be able to tell the truth as honest and straightforward as we can without placing any judgment or any blame. Yoni and I were talking about our patient load, the world today, and just being able to recognize our patients and those that we work with of just listening and not having any agenda, not showing or passing any judgment. I like to practice what I apply here at work and also at home to show um, my kids, my husband, that I do care about their well-being, what happened with their day. So this is part of the healing process of all of us being able to slow down, to recognize there are others among us. Sometimes I think we get kind of wrapped up in all the stress of what's going on that we have a tendency to fly on autopilot. Um, and we're, we're kind of listening, but we're not hearing everything or acknowledging them. And number four, don't be married to the consequences. So be op open to different outcomes and not get attached to that outcome. Sometimes things, there's, this is a cliche, but they happen for a reason. That is just something that I believe. I don't uh, push that up upon any of my patients and families. Uh, some do believe in that. Um, but I always go in with an objective mind and listen to where they have been, where they want to be, and where it's definitely a gift um, to be able to, to do this. Sometimes there are challenges and also being open to these new outcomes. And it was just an interesting, and I encourage people when you do have a free moment to listen to her TED Talk. It's very interesting, the inter generational sharing that is so often used among all different colors, but cultures, but unfortunately here, uh, we don't do that as much. And I think, did I cover all of them? It seems to be. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Jen. So I'm going to use what Jen had to say about the four rules of clinical work so beautifully to be a um, very natural springboard into the, when we're trying to look at healing itself, especially healing, um, no one's asking me for my opinions on neurosurgery, uh, healing for emotional, spiritual, and psychological issues that... Um, a paradigm that I've developed out of um, my own training, my own study, but even more importantly, my own clinical work and my own teaching and my own life experiences, that psychological, social, emotional healing involves a triangle of first understanding, then managing, and then finally, hopefully, utilization. And before I launch into that, I want to return to the um, the last rule of clinical work, don't be married to the consequences. What this means to me 
is such an important part of any healing process of that is of any issue that's psychological, social, emotional, spiritual, which is process indeed over product. That if we come into the healing process with a predetermined concept of where we are supposed to end up, of what the end result needs to be in our estimation, then inevitably what happens is that our assessments of what is happening and what we think might be wrong are then warped to fit that predetermined product. In my years as a clinician, as a teacher, and as a human being on this planet, I've seen that the product will be, even if we try to control it anxiously, the product is going to end up being exactly what it was supposed to be. The process, on the other hand, whether it is a healthy process, an unhealthy process, an effective one, an ineffective one, one that is compassionate and full of insight or um, shallow, um, is much more under our control and should be the focus of our efforts. So with that in mind, this openness to going wherever our lives take us um, cause we are indeed very small actors in this, you know, in this universe, we embark upon this triangle of understanding, managing, and utilization. And when I talk about understanding, so understanding from a psychodynamic standpoint means, or potentially means far more than simply a cognitive uh, take on who we are, what we're feeling, and what's going on with us. And my uh, my Jungian psychoanalyst, who I worked with for many years, uh, the the acclaimed Dr. Ashok Bedi, uh, a psychiatrist right here in Milwaukee, an incredible Jungian practitioner, taught me early in our work together that among the many differences between Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, a really, really important one is that they had different understandings of understanding. Freud believed passionately, and I've seen this quoted um, by other psychoanalysts, Eric Fromm being one of them, that Freud believed very passionately that understanding was really the name of the game that as human beings, if we could come to a full understanding of not only what we are struggling with, but where it comes from, a why, a deeper um, comprehension of how it has come to be and what need has it filled in us, healthy or otherwise, that, that act of understanding, which is a therapeutic, a therapeutic act in and of itself, just like being present to someone, as Jen was talking about, this is the way I press upon my chaplain students, simply being present is a, a deeply important therapeutic act that is not only a preparation to doing something or doing nothing, it is an act and often the most important one you can do. Hmm. Freud believed that if we come to a deep understanding of what's of who we are and what's going on, that that's going to take us a long way down the road towards being able to reach a more um, a new way of being and a resolution of the problem. Carl Jung said nothing doing. Uh, he said to his one-time mentor, um, no, understanding is only a practical step that understanding means we have a working a working knowledge of who we are and what we're contending with in no way shape or form does that include the hard work of doing something about it of trying to integrate that issue within us and 
as a younger clinician and younger teacher, I really thought Jung had uh, pinned Freud to the mat, so to speak. I really thought that Jung uh, was correct and had it and had that um, basically that in that argument that he was clearly in the right. As my career has progressed and I've added on years, I'm hearing even deeper than understanding, knowing, I am hearing, I am feeling the wisdom of Freud's position more and more. That within an understanding of who we are and what we contend with, that takes us a long way in that process to the product that we're destined to reach. But this is only the first step in terms of the healing process, because we come to this understanding where we then can proceed to is what I call management and what this means. You know, we think of anxiety and if we are unable to manage our anxiety, it's paralytic essentially. And we can't do anything else. We were, it's like an electrical system where the float, the fuse has been blown we, we can't function. We, we can't live our lives in a normal way. Management means that we're able to understand that whatever we're contending with is part of us, but not all of us. Just like a cancer patient is someone who has cancer. The cancer does not define them. It's part of them, but it's not all of them. And management means that we have an ability to function in its presence, it's part of us. Um, however, we can, you know we can keep going, so that's management, and that that's a significant step in and of itself. Mm-hmm. However, the third step, which does not always happen, but especially as all of us are certainly, I think the vast majority of the people um, yeah, on this call are clinicians. As clinicians, I deeply feel that hopefully we get to the level of utilization. And utilization means that we see the issues we contend with not simply as negatives, as obstacles to be avoided or crushed and then forgotten, disposed with. No. Our issues contending with those issues, that process of coming to terms with them and internalizing them, managing them, is where the the learning, Carl Jung talked about the gold, the gold in the shadow. The deepest learning and growth that we have comes from intentionally contending with the aspects of ourselves that are the most difficult to deal with and finding ways to recognize that they are as much as the parts we're proud of, part of us, and they have things to teach us. If those issues, those problems can become pathways to empathy with others, I've dealt with this, this is part of me, I see that it's part of you too. And we don't have to tell our stories to the to the other person to do with this. We can just be aware of it. This becomes a foundation for our depth and power. As clinicians, I think it's the, the most important foundation beyond our connection and service to something I believe larger than ourselves, however we construe that. In addition to that, an ability to utilize what we've come through becomes really some of the most important aspects of how we can do the work of healing both for ourselves and to facilitate the healing of others with depth and with power. Marty, how are we for time? You guys are in about 25 minutes, and you guys can take as much time as you'd like. Okay. (laughs) So just to wrap up this section, and I would like to have time for questions and for free dialogue with the people here on the call. Um. The healing process 
is not, I think, as Western medicine often has us to think, that we have a state of equilibrium. Something comes comes to us outside of that state of equilibrium that is malevolent. It is neutralized, disposed of, um, gotten rid of, and then we return to our benevolent, our benign state of nature and our state of equilibrium, and we uh, heave a sigh of relief and say, thank goodness that we've come, you know, we've come through that and don't have to contend with it anymore. And that's, you know, and that's the end of it. As a chaplain who both suffered and learned deeply as a frontline worker during COVID, it has been difficult for me to experience um, the phenomenon of the world around me moving on disturbingly quickly from all, everything we experienced and and suffered and worked for during COVID to support our fellow human beings. And I understand it as an impulse, as a human impulse, as a way to cope and survive. I yearn for a conversation to sit down and I mean, COVID is just one example. How do we listen to the voice of what we went through and of what we contended with and how we changed as a result? As opposed to, whoo, you know, got through that and let's not look back uh, lest we be turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, something in the chat. Ah. I think that's a good place to pause. Jen, do you agree? I think it's a good place to pause and see if anybody has any questions. So, Yoni, if we do not do this, if we just stop at understanding or maybe don't even take that approach, just ignore it altogether. Mm hmm can you talk a little bit about some of the, the the pitfalls that befall some of us clinicians, chaplains, social workers, et cetera? Sure. Uh, I would love to. That, my my dear friends and colleagues, is the onset of what I call the dreaded waterbed effect. So the waterbed effect for, and I'm, I'm dating myself here to be someone who is old enough to at least have a childhood that remembers waterbeds. Um, waterbeds were, you know, when you have a mattress, that's not really a mattress. It's essentially a sack filled with with heated water, and you, you know, very popular in the seventies, and you lay down on this, and um, this was, you know, what you used. The one of the challenges of waterbeds um, was that the water itself, being a liquid is not very predictable. So if you push down on one side of the waterbed, like for example, to get into it, that water doesn't just stay in place. It surges to a different part of the waterbed and you're not always going to know wh in what other area of the bed it was going to surge to and then pop up. So this led to often not a very comfortable sleep, but what how that applies here it is my deep belief, and it's been my clinical and educational observation, that if we do not travel the path of at least understanding and management, that emotions and experiences, emotions in particular, are much like uh, energies. We understand it from the ther thermodynamic laws of physics. Nothing is truly created and certainly not destroyed. That those emotions will stay within us. Those experiences will stay within us. And if we do not try to understand them, to listen to them, and to manage them at the very least, they corrode us from the inside. Um, 
to cite the ACE study, you know, the ACE studies and um, many, many, I mean, um, go on the um, substance abuse and mental health website of the federal government and Google trauma-informed care and then wait for your computer to cool off, um, you'll see that the research and clinical evidence of what happens when we do not come, we do not contend with what is inside of us um, has been proven and is dramatic. And I'm going to end my answer with a favorite quote of mine. Marty knows it well, because I've quoted it many, many times. Um, and it's from the Gnostic Gospel of St. Thomas. It's a famous quote. And it says, if you have something inside of you and you bring it forth, what you bring forth will save you. If you have something inside of you and you do not bring it forth, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And I've always said, if I was going to choose one quote that encapsulated the heart of psycho psychodynamic psychology, that's it. Yoni, it also it sound it sounds like you also subscribe maybe a little bit into leaning into who you are because part of this is the the understanding, the managing, and the not disposing, but coming to terms with and working with in some ways. And I'm not saying you lean into everything that you are because you're a mixture of some good and some not good, but but perhaps finding ways to lean into and working with what you have. But the not the not good mm. <clears throat> is equally mm -hmm. as much who we are as the good. And in some ways, because of its hiddenness, the not good can have a more profound impact on how we understand ourselves and then and what we do and how we interact with others than even the good. So um, we have to we we have to lean into who we are because we simply don't have a choice, especially as clinicians, but also as regular people. We bring ourselves. We it's like we're dragging you know luggage around an airport. We bring ourselves into into every encounter with every human being that we have. That's unavoidable. So we might as well utilize it. It's going to happen anyway. Um, and the and again, the parts of ourselves that are, so to speak, not good, that we're not proud of, that we struggle with. And, you know, this is borne out by the research, but also borne out um, in my years of being a clinician and teaching. It's exactly what we're going to learn the most from. That That's simply the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes we have to, with our things that, I don't like to call them bad, the things that we're working on, sometimes that includes going outside of our comfort and doing some of our own work, whether it's with professionals, there are that we can do to help ourselves through everything that we have been through throughout our lives, because not everything in life is good. And hopefully things in life are temporarily uncomfortable and maybe not great, but maybe we can learn from those experiences, grow from those experiences um, and just use that as a continuous path because we're all growing as we get older, we experience different things, meet different people. And what I really loved about um, Angel's presentation is just how much she talks about things cross-culturally. And sometimes we forget that we don't have to depend on ourselves of finding all the information. Mm -hmm to utilize others around us because others have gone through uh, 
sometimes maybe similar things, uh, experiences, but it doesn't mean that we have to divulge everything. Sometimes it's a matter of having that good balance of disclosure uh, with colleagues, uh, Yoni and I talk about things that kind of are on our mind, and I know it's a safe zone. It's a humorous zone. It it rolls into whatever we're going through at that time. But also at the end of the day, it's two utilizing people that are supportive of you, and that. Um, with the lungo therapy that we'll touch a little bit more on uh, next time. Uh, the founder of it, he is very well accomplished man uh, and then was taken off to a concentration and during his time in there found that those who sought out purpose in their life didn't suffer um, and were more resilient people. And so it's a matter of finding in your life what brings you meaning. Sometimes that can be hard, especially when we're bogged down with a lot of things in life and picking and choosing what is a priority, what does bring us meaning to life. It may not make us happy, and that's sometimes I think what people hold on to is that meaning in life should bring happiness and contentment, right. but it doesn't. Yeah. And it's, from, yeah, it's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Happiness is fleeting. I mean, it's great, but it's fleeting. It's not something to build your whole existence on mm -hmm. and much much more enduring is having a sense of why you're here, which is what we're going to be looking at in the next, in our next talk is mm -hmm. what does it mean to build your life, to build your self-conception and your conception of what you do on the foundation of the quest for meaning and purpose. And that changes one's perception of the suffering you inevitably encounter profoundly. One last quick question for you guys, and then maybe we'll we'll finish it up unless you guys have anything else you want to add. But some of this work is done with the therapist. Some of this work is done with trusted colleagues like us having lunch periodically for, for that person who maybe doesn't have somebody or prefers to do more of their own introspection. Do you have any advice for how, what questions or how to even begin to try to explore some of some of this understanding? I do. Um, what I say to patients in the hospital often, um, I am acutely aware of the, the fact that many, if not most, of the patients that we see um, are not availing themselves of mental health support, of psychotherapy, of you know mental health, you know mental health care, um, on any you know any sort of certainly a regular or even an occasional basis. Um, and that's for a multitude of reasons in our healthcare delivery system. And one piece of practical advice that I've given uh, patients is to say. Listen, if you can avail yourself of a, of a professional relationship of someone who can listen to you, that's fantastic. However, in addition to that, or in place of that, do you have someone in your life who can listen to what you have to say, be present to who you are and what you're going through, and not jump either to providing you the solution to what they think is the problem or to hold you in judgment as to who you are slash what you've done. Do you have someone in your life who, in short, 
can actually listen and is not waiting for your lips to stop flapping so that they can tell you what you what you need to do. If you have that, and I've as as I've seen many times, tragically, not all of us have that in our lives. Mm -hmm. But if you do, my advice always is um, be very nice to that person and talk to them, enlist their support. Because being a facilitator, being a midwife to that kind of healing is one of the noblest and most important things that we can do, not only for ourselves, but for others. Um, in my tradition, the Jewish tradition, I understand that as a mitzvah, it's a commandment. Um, regardless, I believe that cross-culturally, the ability to be someone who can help provide a safe environment for people to simply be themselves. There are few, if any, greater gifts you can extend to yourself or to others. That's that's the 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 first step. Um, I think the second step is to understand that healing is a long term process. It is not um, get rich quick. And when I first started psychoanalysis, um, about a month into the process, I began the session with my analyst and said, I feel like my whole life is changing and I'm driving all these benefits and I feel like I understand everything and, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. And I feel like I've made real headway on so many of my, of my issues. And the analyst um, did his did his best to give me the most compassionate version of I'm glad you feel that way as a clinician. I don't really trust it. It, it, a lifetime of being is not changed um, in a moment. Give yourself patience and room to make turns backwards, sideways. Um, Carl Jung understood the process of healing as circumambulation, which is that when you go up a mountain, you don't go straight up a mountain almost ever. It doesn't usually work that way. You have to go around and around and around the mountain to get to the top. And sometimes that, that going around can feel like you're reverting, you're going back, but that's not the case. And Jewish tradition actually said the same thing hundreds of years before that. That's a start. Thank you both for your wisdom today. Is there any other parting pieces or advice you'd like to leave us with? Jen? I think the biggest thing in the healing process is taking that time to slow down, to look at each day as a new day to start being your best self. That what happened yesterday are sometimes we do need to sleep on things. It's just too much for us to handle at the time. And sometimes with more perspective and some time of reflection. Reflection, uh, I am a huge proponent of anyone who is struggling with anything uh, to take that time. Uh, you know, try to find that 10, 15 minutes of silence in your day. And try not to let your problem solving within your brain want to solve the problem, but to acknowledge the problem. Um, and then moving forward, your definition of what is really going on may lead you down a path of other things that you've discovered in your reflections. And sometimes writing those down can be really helpful. 
and finding a path of, is there a theme? And just being kind to yourself, making mm -hmm. sure that you are taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and that's more we'll get into as we move forward. But at the end of the day, you need to take care of you in the you know how and with time and hopefully with the the bit of others around you will help you through times in life to another side that is brighter and more content and peaceful. Lovely. Thank you both. We look forward to part two at some point later this winter. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Adios.